we move up here, I'll point out this, <coughs> this item. This is a one-sixth scale model of a P-47 uh, aircraft. The P-47 was the uh, fighter that held the ground until we got the P-51, and it came into uh, the inventory, and then it was uh, relegated to an air-to-ground fighter. Um, very heavy. It had eight 50 caliber machine guns in this uh, in this mock-up here, you can see uh, the actual detail of it. This was a flying radio-controlled aircraft, 1-6 scale model. It won several awards. The sister of this is actually on display at the Air and Space Museum. And it's modeled after an actual aircraft called Fireball and its pilot, Lieutenant Kuhn. Again, a great, uh, great uh, display for you to come in. Last thing we're going to look at before we talk about aircraft is another unique display. This is called a British Sea Fort. If you can see this, this is the uh, uh, water here. Uh, the British had a unique problem. That was how do you build a fort to defend against um, submarines and air attacks. If you know the history of Britain and certainly of London, you know that that's been occupied since medieval times, certainly before um, the, the Romans or around the time the Roman Empire was there. If you wanted to build a fort, you had to bulldoze out somebody's neighborhood. Nobody wanted to do that, so they came up with a very unique idea. Why don't we build these forts on pontoons and then tow them into position? And these forts were placed around the Thames River and out uh, along the southern end of England, and the crews would actually live aboard these. Here you had the anti-aircraft guns on the decks of this uh, tower, if you will, and uh, about every six weeks the, the crew, it looks kind of like a boat really, would be able to come off of this uh, fort and go to the shore and have a shore leave. But the real story of this, if you Google the word British Sea Fort and the word Sea Land, you will find out about one of these uh, towers or, sea, or forts. After the war, they were left in place by the British government. Many of them became just rusting hulks and uh, hazards to navigation. A uh, pirate radio station was run off of one of them. And there was one of them uh, down on the southern end of England that happened to be right at the Three Mile Island. A family got aboard this and kind of took over it and established their own country. They published their own passports, their own stamps, their own currency, and they raised their own family. And they actually were a, munis a, a principality that was recognized by several other uh, governments in the, uh, in the world. And um, it's quite an interesting story how they raised their family out in this uh, tower that became its own country. Next, we're going to go and look um, behind you is an aircraft that we have on display. Uh, and helps lead us out into um, the main exhibit hall. This is something called a Grumman Avenger Wildcat. This is a unique aircraft uh, because of where it came from. It came from Lake Michigan. Well, let me tell you a little bit about that. The Navy had a unique problem in World War II, and that was how do they train their carrier pilots because they didn't have any aircraft carriers. By that I mean they were all out in the Pacific just trying to hold the line against the Japanese. You can't just draw a line and say, okay, start here, but take off before you get over there. That's not very realistic. So the Navy went up to Lake Michigan, and they found two of these side wheel, paddle wheel tourist boats that you see in this picture here. They were just tourist boats. They tore them down and put a flat deck on them and rechristened them the USS Sable and the USS Wolverine. And these two boats became the training boat carriers, uh, flat decks on the top of them, from which all Navy pilots had to land and take off. Now this aircraft right here in 1943 had a power failure coming off the USS Sable and crashed into Lake Michigan, where it laid for almost 50 years before it was discovered. There's some pictures uh, that probably will not come through, but you can get an idea of what it looked like when it was discovered. It came here. We took us seven years because we are a volunteer outfit. We only work in our restoration facility on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. It took seven years for them to restore this to an exhibit condition. We got ready to, uh, to um, dedicate this aircraft. We went back to the Navy. We were interested in the pilot. We knew the pilot's name was Dixie Howell, and we knew he survived the crash, but we didn't know if he was killed later in, war in World War II or if he was still alive. Our, our World War II veterans are leaving us at an ever-increasing rate. The Navy actually found Dixie Howell alive and well and living in Ocala, Florida. Go figure after all this. He came over and said, geez, the aircraft looks better today than it did when, uh, when I crashed it. Mr. Howell is in his 90s. He's still alive. He comes to the museum 
and talks to us periodically. It's a great piece of history, and he actually flew and crashed in this aircraft as an aviation student. So at this time, we're going to go out into the main hangar. We'll talk uh, about some of the aircraft that we have out here. As you go out in here, you'll see a lot of aircraft sitting out here. The one that you see most predominantly is this one with the stripes on it over here. It's called a C-47. This aircraft actually flew in World War II in the Normandy invasion on June 6, 1944. It was made in 1942, and as we walk around here, you'll be able to see the various black and white stripes that we have on it. These are invasion stripes. All aircraft in World War II for the Normandy invasion, whether they were fighter aircraft, bombers, or cargo airplanes, had these invasion stripes on it as a way to help us identify um, friendly uh, aircraft from enemy aircraft. This aircraft not only flew in the Normandy invasion, she also flew at Cherbourg, which was a battle for a French port, Operation Varsity, which was the invasion of the actual Rhineland, uh, the Battle of the Bulge, the Berlin Airlift, and then after the war she went to uh, under Lynn Lease to the Norwegian Air Force, who flew her for about seven years before they sold her to the Danish Air Force, who used her as a support aircraft for the Royal Danish family. In 1982, the Valiant Air Command, together with Royal Danish Air Force pilots, flew her back here, and she's been flying ever since, 68 years. We fly here a couple of times a month. If you're interested in her flying in a real piece of history, contact the museum, and we'll sign you up and reserve you a seat. Some other aircraft that you can see uh, just uh, from this location, a couple of uh, older airplanes. This is uh, just after World War I. It's called a Tiger Moth, and the red airplane you see over here is uh, modeled after the uh, original uh, Red Baron aircraft. It's a triplane. We have a Southwest Camel, which was a Snoopy uh, aircraft that you see in the cartoons that used to fight the Red Baron. But our Southwest Camel is now away uh, undergoing some maintenance, but it will be back. This is a real piece of uh, history. It flies. For our air show, you get the Red Baron and the Southwest Camel doing World War I uh, air combat maneuvering. So the, uh, the next uh, line that we're going to go through, we're going to walk through this direction, is the Korean War we're going to talk a little bit about. We have some other World War II aircraft that we'll catch up on the other side to show you. The first uh, Korean War aircraft you see here is this MiG-15. This is the first operational Navy jet called a Panther that is of the Korean War vintage. This MiG-15, when it first showed up in the skies over Korea, was a very, very dominant fighter. The first air-to-air jet-to-jet combat occurred in the world in the skies over Korea between a MiG-15 and an aircraft we have outside, I'll show you in just a second, called a Shooting Star. On that day, the Shooting Star, the American shot down the MiG-15, but I'm sure he went back to his boss and said, I don't want to do that every day. And the reason is, the MiG-15, as you can see, has this swept back wing. It was really a very pretty fighter for its time, you know, very fast, very nimble, and our aircraft, like this Panther, had straight wings. The Shooting Star had a straight wing and it just was not as maneuverable against this MiG-15. What the Air Force ultimately came up with is this aircraft over here, we're going to walk over and show you, it's called an F-86 Sabre Jet. We went through a couple of iterations, something called an F-84, and then ultimately we came up with this F-86. Uh, this happens to be in a demonstration team, a European demonstration team, but here you can see the swept back wings on this. It had 60, 50 caliber machine guns, and it really became known as the MiG killer. It had about a 10 to 1 kill ratio over that MiG-15, and it takes five aircraft, you have to shoot down five aircraft to be considered an ace. Of the 43 aces in the Korean War, all but one got it in the F-86. So this really was an air supremacy fighter and an aircraft that, that greatly uh, took over the skies of Korea uh, and uh, ruled it over the MiG-15. The next aircraft that we're going to look at, I'll just show you briefly the uh, F-14 Tomcat that we have in here. I know everybody's seen the movie Top Gun. And the blue one we have over here is the F-A-18 Hornet. Some of the other aircraft, this nice uh, pretty yellow one is a, uh, a Stearman. It is um, 
a trainer that we used during uh, the 50s and 60s, this F-18. And from here, we're going to walk just across now the, the Vietnam memorabilia room. This is full of artifacts and donations from folks that served in Vietnam as uh, military aviators in the Army, the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Air Force. Uh, there's a lot of uh, war-era maps in here, uh, flight gear, and just uh, different models that someone who is perhaps a historian or served in the Vietnam era will recognize as you go through and look at some of these items. This uh, building was only uh, dedicated in July of 2011, so it's just a little over a year old and we're still working on many of the displays that you see in here. We're going to walk outside and, and take a look at the aircraft that we have in the Vietnam hangar. The first aircraft that you'll see, very emblematic of the Vietnam War, is the Huey helicopter. One of the, uh, one of the aircraft that I flew, and uh, no matter what service you were in, uh, everybody will remember that very distinctive wop, 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 wop. Uh, this had uh, four primary missions, a command and control mission. Uh, it served as a gunship early in the war. Uh, it served as a slick, what we would call uh, a slick, meaning it didn't have anything on it, just haul men and material from point A to point B. And last mission, uh, generally accepted mission, would be as a medevac. Uh, it served as a uh, air ambulance, which would go to the battlefield and pick, uh, pick folks up. Vietnam was really the first helicopter war. Uh, while there were some uh, helicopters, everybody knows seeing MASH, knows that there were some uh, helicopters used for air evacuation. Vietnam was the first war where helicopters were used exclusively to move troops to and from the battlefield. Uh, the battles were taking place off the road. For the first time, you didn't ride to battle in the back of a deuce and a half or a truck. Uh, you, you rode in the back of a helicopter because where you were going was inaccessible by road. So Vietnam was really the, the first uh, helicopter role, and we have continued to use helicopters as part of the military uh, aviation and supporting the battle commander uh, in war since then. We'll look around and I'll just uh, point out some aircraft for you as we walk around. This is the famous A-4 uh, Skyhawk. Uh, the aircraft that we are undergoing some painting here is an A-7. It was an air-to-ground aircraft. Uh, it strictly uh, took on the targets on the ground. It's called the Corsair II. And as you come around that corner, and look under our American flag, you're going to see uh, an aircraft that uh, most people might uh, recognize some Danny Glover in the movie uh, Flight of the Intruder. This is the A-6 Intruder. It was an all-weather uh, bomber. Um, oh, yeah, that was the movie they wanted to go and bomb Hanoi with. Exactly. This aircraft, uh, what made this aircraft good or great is what was inside here. If I could open this up. When I opened up the nose and swung it back, what you'd see is a big dish, looks like a satellite dish. That was its all-terrain of weather. In the time that this aircraft came out, this was revolutionary. This aircraft could take off of an aircraft carrier in the worst weather in the Gulf of Tonkin, fly uh, following the terrain down low all the way to a target in, say, uh, North uh, Vietnam, bomb it and come all the way back because of the extensive radar and terrain following capability that it had. It did not have two pilots. Uh, the crew sat side by side up there and the right seater was the bomber, navigator, the technician that sat in the right seat, worked all of the instruments and worked out um, the bombing which was the primary mission for this aircraft. The other aircraft that you see in the back, the large aircraft, uh, kind of brown color, that is an F-105 Thunder Chief largest, heaviest single seat uh, Air Force uh, fighter that we ever had, although it was used uh, primarily, even though it's called an F-105, it was used as a bomber, uh, had a huge bomb bay under it because it was made uh, originally as a plane to handle an atomic uh, or nuclear mission. The bomb bay started here, goes all the way back to the back. Internally, this aircraft could handle between what you could put inside plus what you could put on the hard points on the wing, it could carry as much uh, armament as a World War II B-17. This poor, uh, poor beast has been outside for many years and uh, we're in the process, as you can see on the side.